uh, what a year it's been and how far along have we come through. Uh, you know, what have your feelings been about the year and any sort of fun stories for you to share with us? Oh, yeah, certainly. It, it has been, uh, at least for folks like me who are empty nesters, it has been a blessing. The family is here now. At least I get to spend more time with my kids. Uh, but uh, there is a funny story about streaming that, that comes to mind. Uh, back in my techie days, I had this massive collection of my favorite CDs and audio cassettes in my personal library. So, you know, in one of those Thanksgiving deals, I got a two terabyte external drive, got super excited. I, I got my own personal cluster in my house. I got all my uh, media converted into MP3 files. I set up a local storage server on that cluster. I had high availability, so it keeps running all the time. I was so proud of myself. And I said, okay, I'm going to take the next step now and take all my video cassettes and my, uh, my DVDs and see if I can create a video streaming server. Well, uh, I made a big announcement, uh, demo day arrived. My wife and daughters, they sat back and they were ready to enjoy the collection. Right when I click on my first video, <laughs> my program ran out of memory and the movie kept buffering. Now the screen was frozen with my two year old, unable to reach that ice cream bar, which is just two inches away from her. <laughs> and that screen is what my family gives me a hard time about all the time when they say, oh, you and streaming, please don't create that ice cream scene for us. So <laughs> that, that's my personal story for you. That is amazing. And now you're having ice cream in a whole different way with a really fun binging experience. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a wonderful time right now to uh, to you know this is the golden time for streaming and the kind of content that is available nowadays. It's unbelievable. So we have come a long way from those early days of homegrown streaming solutions. So that takes us to today's topic, which is media management in a streaming world. And we consume all kinds of music and video via streaming. Um, you all heard Discovery Plus got launched last week. And uh, HBO Max came out with this big announcement about streaming all of their new movies on that platform, a big, big decision. Um, so there are all kinds of headlines that are popping up all the time. I, I still remember it was probably in January, I attended uh, Bob Iger's event in New York City and uh, he was just about to launch his uh, Disney Plus uh, streaming channel and he, he was also launching his book. And uh, uh, and it was only a matter of time. What a stupendous success it has been. I mean, 62 million plus subscribers in a span of months. And, and we are seeing this war of streaming has just begun. And, and as, as, as the titles at Wall Street Journal and other places are coming out, they are all talking about how uh, the various platforms and the, the plethora of options that are available to people, uh, it's, it's just a completely new age. And, and what this means is that there are important trends that are emerging out of it. And, and maybe, Mitesh, you can tell us about what are some of those trends that you are seeing. Absolutely. Thank you, Prajesh. That's a great start. And, you know, so with this, all these sort of momentum happening in the COVID world, what we have seen is that trends that were already in place have been accelerated faster than anybody could have ever imagined. Uh, starting with, you know, the amount of content that is being consumed, 1.4 billion hours per month, which is just staggering. The amount of time that we are all spending at home consuming content on our favorite devices. Uh, and it's been not just the TV space, but really a series of devices on a series of platforms. To put this number in perspective, last year, we were at about 1.2 billion. So that's 200 million incremental viewing hours per month on OTT alone. That is just staggering. Next, when we look at what has happened in the space is we have pulled the demand up front by almost three years. The things that we saw uh, in terms of consumption that would have happened sometime around 2023, 24 have happened now in 2020. So a tremendous amount of subscribers have jumped the streaming bandwagon and a lot of the demand has been pulled up front. And when we think of its implications, which we'll get to on a later slide, it's really staggering where all these players now have to catch up to this reality and we'll dig deeper into that, but something to think about here. Uh, next is when we think of revenue growth, uh, where last year we were at about 83 billion. 
we have grown from 83 to 100 billion in just a year's time. And this number is global. It's representing your advertising uh, model as well as the PR play subscription models. So it's amazing to see how much all that momentum has grown across categories, whether you're dependent on subscriber growth or advertising growth, it's really shown across in the numbers here. Uh, so, you know, with that uh, sort of look at what we have done so far in 2020, uh, where do we go now next becomes a really important thing to focus on as well. So next, when we think of where that sort of demand has been pulled ahead and, and what will that sort of curve look like for the future of this platform, uh, one is, as you see, you know, in 2020, we were originally expecting only 192.7 million subscribers in US, but instead we now have 207.5 million. This again, uh, far exceeds even what we thought we would achieve in 2023. A lot of that demand upfront with that big spike. And then when we think of what is its implications on not only the US market, but a global market where in the US market, because that demand has been pulled up front, you see the sort of curve more or less gets flattened, which means that US as a market is getting pretty mature. And what would happen is it will become a winner takes all space where maybe three or four players dominate. Uh, and we're already seeing some of those beginning to dominate. The rest of the players, the sort of long tail of players will need to either get consolidated or partner with the bigger players to reach that sort of mass scale. So that is in the US market, we are already beginning to see a big pull up front along with the maturity for the years ahead. And if we look at it from a global standpoint, as the US market is getting mature, a lot of the high momentum growth for the years ahead will come from emerging markets. So that will be something to think about as our companies and the media players are thinking of what will be the strategy for the years ahead and how do you actually deliver best in class experiences. When we think of, you know, what does this sort of uh, growth in subscriber base actually mean for the opportunities where about 14.5 million incremental growth in terms of customer base will happen in the next uh, four years. So you're having already that acceleration uh, with new co you know, customers coming in and adopting to the streaming players and revenues that were originally projected at 100 billion are now actually going to reach 167 billion by 2025. What that means is, as the slowing uh, adoption happens uh, in mature markets like US and high growth uh, adoption happens in emerging markets, how do you actually leverage analytics and strategy to drive higher lifetime value uh, by delivering on best in class experiences to your customers will be more important than ever before. How do you sort of accelerate that lifetime value? Extremely important point something to think about. This will also have implications on your business model. Do you push harder on uh, subscription growth or advertising growth, or do you play both in parallel? Something to think about for all the you know, listeners out there. Uh, what it also means is as these revenue growth is happening and the markets are getting more mature, most of the customers that are coming on board are very different breed. Uh, these are not your early adopters. These are really the ones who will stick around if they feel that they're getting their money's worth. So most of the customers who are signing up now in 2020 and onward will likely be ones that actually stick around and drive long-term growth for your companies uh, with a 92% uh, retention rate. So, you know, with all that said, Rajesh, what do you feel are the implications of this uh, for the media players out there? Yeah, thank you, Mitesh. I think these are very important trends that you've pointed out, and, and they also represent significant opportunities. Um, we, as most of you probably are aware, Genpact works very closely with clients in the media and entertainment industry. And, and based on uh, all the uh, conversations we have been having, we are seeing there are tremendous opportunities, but the way each company is going about it or the newcomers are trying to go into it it's, it's, it's quite different dependent on how they see the problem. Uh, but in order to take advantage of this, they have to look at the overall picture holistically. And at the core of it is data. It is a foundational element. And they need to figure out, do they have the right ecosystem with respect to data in place or not? And if they have data ecosystem, do they have IP management and monetization solutions 
that can be deployed easily within the existing tech landscape? Do they have years of technology debt accumulated, which will get in the way and create massive bottlenecks? And, and have they finally become aware of the issues around trust and safety? Or are they keeping that on the side thinking, oh, it's, it will just take care of itself? No, those are important areas. And this is particularly relevant to scenarios when the content carried, it touches different geographies. And of course, it becomes a huge focus area if you're dealing with user-generated content. These are all various things in which uh, our folks at Genpact and my entire team uh, has been working very closely with clients all over the world. So let me, let me pause here and tell you, um, before, before we talk about the various uh, ecosystems that are relevant, what are the streaming business models? That's, that's where it all starts. And there are primarily three scenarios. And folks who have spent a lifetime in the media world, they know exactly what these are, but I'm just, just to level set everyone's understanding. Number one is the advertiser supported. Second is premium subscription-based. And the third is transactional one-off payment-based model. So when it comes to video, we call them as AVOD, SVOD, or TVOD. Those are the acronyms that most of the folks in the industry uh, are very familiar with. So if you look at from a choice between these business models, the advantage with the ad-based model is that it's easy to get new subscribers, say for example, YouTube or Pandora when they started. Customers get hooked on easily, and you could open the path to premium if you have decent amount of content. But the downside of this model is that you don't make a lot of money and the initial customers might get turned off with the ads. Plus, you can't get many advertisers until you reach a certain level of subscription. Next, if you look at the subscription-based premium model, your consumers love it because they enjoy all kinds of content. And, uh, and for you as a provider, you have a relatively predictable revenue stream. So this is the model that is gaining a lot of popularity as we know with Netflix and Spotify. But the downside is that it takes time to build a loyal set of subscribers. Uh, disputes could mean you lose audience. For instance, when Disney took off its content from Netflix, well, you know what happened, those, uh, happened to those consumers. And then when Spotify was dealing with all the royalty related disputes with the various artists, that was a rough time for them. Then uh, finally, if you go with to, uh, into the transaction-based model, uh, you essentially have a straightforward approach. You pay for a movie or a song and you enjoy it. The advantage is it's very simple, but the downside is it, it, there is no consistency. You cannot predict what kind of revenue is likely to come and so on. And also consumers don't like to be nickel and dimed. Every time I want to watch something, I don't want to shelve out and, and, and pay money and so on. So there are variations of these three out there, but the foundational decision for a media streaming company is to figure out which model they want to go after. And there's plenty of academic research that has gone into it. They see it as an interaction of three key entities, users, content providers, and advertisers. Users enjoy a platform service when the variety of content increases. And in turn, a content provider and an advertiser have strong incentives to join your platform when they can meet a wider audience. So in terms of business strategy, this is a chicken and egg problem. The company needs to find the most profitable way to attract a critical mass in each group. So the research findings, uh, and I won't belabor that point, but essentially what they have come up with is that a wide audience can afford to, uh, a, a wide audience can afford to offer a premium subscription. So if you have access to massive geography and a lot of consumers, you can, you can afford to go with the second premium subscription based model. But if you have a smaller platform and a, a niche set of clients, then you are better off with a subscription based system where you are charging for specific parts and you're going with the ad based tiered based model. So the critical mass of having the consumers on your platform is the important aspect that you need to figure out. Now, let's say the company has figured out what is the platform strategy. Then the next big area is IP management. And then you've got that entire cycle of licensing, sales, payments, collections, reporting, and whatnot. 
And that is a problem that is pretty well established. It is not something that has come only now with streaming. It has existed before. So there is a good collection of off-the-shelf products. And, and maybe, Mitesh, since you work with such providers all the time, tell us about uh, some of those and, and exactly how that, that whole aspect is solved. Absolutely, Prajesh. Thank you so much. And you know, from a content strategy standpoint, uh, to Prajesh's point, whether you are a Disney or a Peacock or Netflix, that way you go to market, how do you monetize on the content and what sort of content do you actually promote becomes a big part of the play. When we get into IP management, there are several uh, tech providers out there uh, you know, who we work with on an ongoing basis. They serve as the you know, very important module from us uh, for both the pieces, rights as well as royalty management. Uh, on the rights side, you know, as, as Brajesh was saying, this issue has always existed and on the royalty side as well, always existed. But the level of complexity that has now come to place with a really uh, wide audience getting expanded on the digital side compared to the linear side with the sort of complexity across the way you deliver the platforms, what business models in what regions, all those contracts uh, on the royalty side and all those sophistication uh, you know, compliance monitoring on the right side, all of them have just sort of multiplied uh, to a different level of magnitude. On the right side of things, it's become very important for uh, the media companies to think of not only upfront, which sort of content am I gonna focus on in which markets? You may have licensing rights for US, but maybe not have licensing rights for Asia. That becomes an important play. When I, you're actually distributing this content, are you gonna focus on a lump sum model or a shared revenue model, that becomes another important play to focus on. So depending on which path you're going, uh, that sort of rights and royalty will be uh, something that will come back and be the Achilles heel for the organization if it is not thought through holistically in this end-to-end -end state. Uh, when we think of rights again, is are you gonna promote the content that you already have in your media library? Or are you actually gonna partner with the smaller players out there and distribute their content? That becomes a big play on the user management side, whether I'm a, a Facebook or a Google on the social media side or a gaming streaming company where uh, we are seeing the rise of Twitch, Twitch has done really, really well and far beyond uh, you know, anything that we could have imagined ever since Amazon has acquired them. So when I'm a you know, game streamer and I'm playing a music in the background that might be copyrighted, that becomes a really you know, big pain point for players like Twitch to think about. And then on the royalty side, if I am distributing the content on advertising side of things or subscription side of things, how do you actually make sure that you're making the most use of the data underneath it to be able to negotiate on those contracts and then monitor those sort of contracts on an ongoing basis? That entire sort of contract lifecycle management are elements to think of in the IP management bucket. When we think of those sort of royalty management pieces, it fits really well into the finance uh, operations elements because you may have been sitting on a massive uh, asset library. Now, how do you figure out what sort of asset library to monetize in different platforms, in different regions? That sort of decision-making becomes a big part in the finance operations. And then as that level of complexity that I was talking about on the contract side of things, are you actually prepared to deal with that massive influx of uh, revenue, billing, and uh, royalty management data that is going to be coming through, is that actually even connected to your ERP systems or your CRM systems on the back end? All those pieces fit together to drive that sort of uh, rapid pivot. And uh, when we think of, you know, what are we hearing in this space connected to these things from our clients firsthand? It's been, uh, you know, really mixed bag where some of our clients who were heavily dependent on linear and were underprepared for digital have had a really tough year where in most cases we have seen linear ad revenues drop as much as 60%. So you can only imagine if, if, you know, if your company was underprepared for OTT uh, and digital revenue uh, from a corporate strategy standpoint or from a technology standpoint, it just has suddenly really hit those players really hard and their revenue, one of their biggest revenue pipeline has shrunk. And on the flip side, uh, where even if you want to drive digital growth, in almost all cases, most of the traditional players did not have a unified view of their customer. 
So if I am on uh, you know media side of things, getting some of the down linear, some of the data on digital, and then maybe I would have some ancillary services around parks or entertainment centers, movie theaters. How do you actually connect all those data sets to figure out you know what 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 type of content does you know Mitesh and Prajesh actually consume? Uh, what are their sort of consumer sort of behavior patterns when they are consuming this content? Uh, are there particular genres that they think really heavily about? Uh, are they more, uh, you know, sort of prone to subscribe versus uh, go on the fr freemium model with sort of advertising based revenues? All those decisions that you need to make in real time almost to drive personalized decisions to drive your revenue is something that most players were just underprepared for. And almost always that unified view of the customer becomes the most important priority for our clients. Third is the flip side of the first point where, where some of the players actually did have a streaming strategy in place, uh, but because we have pulled up front the demand three, four years ahead of the curve, they were just underprepared for the sudden massive surge in, in growth in, uh, in customer base. So when you have this massive growth in customer base, how do you make sure your systems don't fall apart? How do you make sure that that trust and safety, which Brijesh was saying, it's just such an important underrated thing uh, that, that almost most of the players just haven't thought through where if you're gonna see this massive uh, flow in consumption or massive flow in user generated content, can your systems actually handle that uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, from a risk monitoring standpoint, from a content moderation and community moderation standpoint, all those pieces become a very important play and is the underlying uh, data and technology ecosystem able to handle all these things? All these pieces come together. And uh, so, Brijesh, as, as I've spoken about, you know, what we're hearing from the clients, what, are, what would a winning strategy look like to execute this? Yes, very important points, uh, Mitesh. I think uh, you touched upon those there. And, and given our DNA, look, Genfact is a professional services firm. We came out of GE and Lean Six Sigma is in our DNA. So we, for us, any winning strategy has to start out by looking at the process aspect of it. And so when we talk about it, we start out from the finance operations. That's where a lot of the planning and future um, goals that are set up, those have to be looked at. And, and this means for, let's say the FPNA function, a completely new set of metrics churn, number of subscribers, long-term value, by region, by subscriber type, and so on. The type of talent that you require, completely different. Uh, many of the FPNA leaders uh, we work with, they are now going for talent that is well-versed with data engineering. Can you imagine finance folks uh, going after hardcore Python developer, so developers so that they can extract real-time data and build dashboards for decision making and so on. It's it's phenomenal the kind of transformation that is happening. But that's a winning strategy on the finance operation side. Then it extends to the contract lifecycle management. The entire story, Mitesh, you talked about. And then on the other hand, you've got the controllership function that has to adapt itself. Closing the books is a completely different affair in this in this uh, digital world. Then you've got the entire power of data. Mitesh talked about unified views of clients. It's a single identity of your client that has to be sitting in your platform. You have to know whether they are watching a movie, listening to music, visiting a theme park, purchasing merchandise, shopping, browsing, in essence, connecting with your organization in any shape or form. This is where your clients um, can, can be seen as a single unified uh, uh, entity in the platform that you build. And there are, again, off the shelf solutions for customer data platform that allows you to do that. The key is to recognize that integration is important and completeness is very critical. And that means you have to modernize all your workflows. Otherwise you will miss out on the power of digitization. Your data will not be complete. Third is the content monetization, royal management space. Mitesh already touched upon that. Fourth is the trust and safety part. Now, this is super critical on two fronts. One is if you have a platform that has user-generated content, your entire trust and safety strategy has to incorporate both machine learning and human intelligence-based content moderation. It needs to achieve extremely high accuracy. One failure is too many, and there are sometimes lives at stake. So on the other hand, you've got professionally produced content 
And there you have the increasing need to handle sensitivities that are regional or even local. And these sensitivities are changing so dynamically. What was acceptable as a joke, even 10 years ago is no longer acceptable. And your content must, must have all of the meta tags associated with that. On the other hand, you have the entire field of content protection. So watermarking your content and other solutions that 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 we're hearing about at this event and some of the speakers are going to talk about. And finally, it is all about customer experience. You bring everything together in terms of individual personas and catering to their individual needs by bringing as much personalization as they would permit. And that, in a nutshell, is what we call a winning strategy for media management.